Good morning, church. Everybody feels nice. We had baptism today. It's a great, great Sunday. We're continuing our um, sermon series on personal evangelism, and today's message um, is going to be on the practice of personal evangelism. It's going to be a practical message on how to do personal evangelism. Throughout the series, we have covered a bunch of different aspects of personal evangelism. One of the things that we talked about was the way that God intended for evangelism to happen, the way that God intended for his kingdom to grow. Um, we talked a lot about taking our mind and the way that we expect God's kingdom to grow from an event-based thing where events change people, where we do amazing things, to the way that God intended it, which is a more on a personal level. We talked about the fact that God wants to spread his kingdom on a personal level with your coworkers, your neighbors, your family members, the people that are around you. That that is the main way that God's kingdom grows. We've covered that. We've talked about going smaller and maybe a little slower, but more natural when it comes to growing God's kingdom. We've also talked about the fact that every single person who considers themselves part of the body of Christ has the same function that unifies all of us, which is we are all personally responsible to fulfill the work of evangelism that God has set before each one of us, prepared in advance for each one of us to do. Today we're going to go practical. We're going to look at how does personal evangelism, what does it look like practically? We're going to look at some important steps that need to be taken in order to successfully carry out our mission of personal evangelism. We're going to look at four steps, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first one. But these are things that I consider really important on a practical level for personal evangelism. So, for example, God has highlighted somebody for you at your job or a neighbor or whoever it is, a family member, and God has highlighted that person to you. You're praying about them. You're thinking about them. You're wondering, like, God, how? Where do you begin? How do you begin? That's what we're going to talk about with the first step. How do you begin? Because I think that is usually the hardest step. The reason why most people don't practice personal evangelism is because it's really difficult to figure out what the first step is. Okay, so do I just live a good life and be a good example and wait for them to ask me a question about my faith? Is that how I begin? Okay, do I tell them about who my Jesus is and what it is that I do on a Sunday morning? Do I talk to them about the truth of sin and judgment for sin and the consequences of sin, both eternal and practical here on earth? Where do I begin? How do I take that first step of evangelism? And this is really important to get right. I want to say right off the bat that I think that there is a lot of rejection of the gospel that happens, not because of spiritual reasons, not because the devil got in the way. I think there's a lot of rejection of the gospel because we mismanage our opportunities. Jesus talked about evangelism being a harvest that is ready. What happens when you try to pluck something before it's ready? It's a mismanagement of an opportunity. So that first step is vital and there's a timing to it. In fact, when we look into scripture, there is a strategy of how you do personal evangelism and there's a strategy of when you do personal evangelism. So that person that you're praying about, there is a moment that is the best, that is the moment where God says, listen, this is the time. That's what we're talking about in the first step. So in this first step, um, to help kind of highlight it, I'm going to tell you a story from John chapter 7. John chapter 7, um, just like many moments with Jesus, it, it's a fascinating thing that happens, okay? John chapter 7, I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to kind of summarize what happens there, and you can read it at home if you want. But I think John chapter 7 kind of helps highlight the strategy and answers the question of where do we begin with personal evangelism. So here's the scene. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. A lot of people have already heard about Jesus, but he has not gone fully public with his ministry. So there's a lot of people that know about him, but not many people have actually seen him or heard him. But they've definitely heard stories about him. And he has not made everything public yet. 
But he has already healed people and there are people that are talking about it. He actually already did something very provocative by healing somebody on the Sabbath, which was taboo for that culture and for that religion. He healed somebody on the Sabbath. So he already got the attention of the Jewish religious leaders and their kind of distress. And, and in some cases, you're going to see their hatred. That act alone caused a lot of people to want to wipe him off the face of the earth. And so that's the setting. And Jesus is not gone fully public yet, but his brothers come to him and say, listen, there's going to be a huge festival coming up, the Festival of the Tabernacles. It's a national holiday. The whole country will be gathered. All the people will be there and all the religious leaders will be there. This is your time. Go and make yourself public. You want to be a public figure? Because the Bible says his brothers didn't believe that he was the Messiah at, at that time. They said, you want to be a public figure? That's your chance. Everybody's gathered together. Go and sell it sell it sell your message sell who you think you are go and do it but Jesus says no 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 that's not the way that I must spread my kingdom in fact when he goes to this festival he actually goes there in secret he doesn't arrive with fanfare even though everyone at that festival is talking about it he comes there in secret now everybody's gathered together and the conversation of the day is about this guy that everybody heard about but nobody knows some guy named Jesus and there's a lot of opinions being thrown around imagine a bunch of people gathered together the whole country and everybody's just talking they're trying to figure out the question of the day is who is this guy what's his goal what is he and who is he and what's his purpose and so he comes there quietly and everybody's waiting for him to make an appearance it's, the bible says that the leaders were looking for him because they wanted to arrest him people are talking about him but nobody even knows exactly what he looks like and he doesn't show up halfway through the festival jesus goes into the temple courts and just begins to teach he begins to preach and he begins teaching the word of god and everybody's like wow who is this guy not many people understood that that was jesus they didn't know who to look for. But there's a guy who's teaching and he's doing so good. He's being so bold that they say, wow, where does your teaching come from? And Jesus steps and stands up and says something extremely provocative. He says, my teaching doesn't come from me. It comes from the one who sent me, God himself. So this guy who's unknown, who shows up, who just starts teaching, starts telling everybody, listen, this is the voice of God. I'm here sending you a message from God that's what he's essentially saying to them that's not the best introduction probably not the most diplomatic introduction if you're going to make an introduction and try to get people to believe that you're the Messiah and in that same phrase he also addresses the people in the crowd who want to kill him so he's already connecting and saying yeah I'm that Jesus when people hear this, they start saying, some, it becomes divided. People are like, dude, he's demon-possessed. That's a demon-possessed man. The other group of people are amazed at his teaching. They're like, no, there's something unique about him. And then Jesus goes on and goes into even a more provocative topic. He addresses the elephant in the room. See, the thing that was on everybody's mind and the reason why all the people wanted to kill him, the religious leaders, is because he healed somebody on the Sabbath. He doesn't try to hush it. He doesn't try to go around it. He addresses it. The very next thing, he says, listen, you guys, in order to fulfill Moses' law, you guys perform circumcision on the Sabbath. What's your problem with me healing someone on the Sabbath? And then he makes a conclusion about the leaders that are making these statements in front of all the people he says listen your leaders that are saying that they judge by appearance only they don't have the full picture those people are judging incorrectly do you understand in that society he stood up and he said your leaders are incompetent not the best thing to do in a situation like this not the most tactful or strategically planned out moment but Jesus goes right for it and he says he points it out and points out their hypocrisy and points out why they are incorrect and once again everyone begins mumbling everyone begins forming a camp what they believe about him the Jewish leaders are like that's it we got to kill this guy but they're not laying hands on him and so people are trying to figure out okay he just said some crazy stuff but nobody's doing anything the leaders are here that's him they want to but they're not laying a hand on him why 
And so people, some people are like, you know why? If they're not laying a hand on him, they must think he's the real Messiah. But other people are like, no, no, no. How can he be the real Messiah? In fact, we know where he comes from. He comes from Galilee. What good can come from Galilee? No Messiah is going to come from Galilee. And Jesus looks at them and says, you know what? You know where I come from, but you don't know who sent me. And once again, he get, begins to allude to something that almost sounds like he's mocking the religion. He says, listen, God sent me. He's talking and alluding to the fact that he was sent by God. He came from God. That was blasphemy for many people. And everyone began to mumble. And the leader said, that's it, we got to arrest him. So why am I spending time drawing this picture of the situation? I just want you to understand that this was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This was the time for Jesus to really win people over on a center stage. And he goes in there and he says things that you shouldn't say. He doesn't act very diplomatically. And he divides everyone. Everyone has an opinion. Some people think that he's demon-possessed. Some people think that he is a good man, that he's blessed. Some people think that, you know, they want to kill him. Some people, they just want to keep listening to him and hearing him. Some say he's a Messiah. Some say he's a con man. And everybody divides and there's a confusion about who he is. And Jesus did nothing to help with that confusion. And then comes the moment that I think is the central moment of this story. Jesus gets up in this atmosphere where everyone's trying to figure him out. Jesus gets up and he yells loudly. The Bible says this in John 7, 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. He's saying this in an atmosphere of divisiveness, of people trying to figure out who he is. But he's making a bold statement. What he's saying is this. You can have an opinion of me that's positive. You can have an opinion that is negative. But here's the truth. The only people who will drink from me, the only people who will receive from me, the only people who will believe in me are those who are thirsty. It's not about your opinion. It's not about swaying someone. That's why he never tried. He makes a statement and says, the only people that will drink from me are those who are thirsty. And he's obviously not talking about physical thirst. He's talking about a spiritual thirst. And herein is the first step of evangelism, practically. We begin with the people who are thirsty. We begin with a harvest that is ready. That's what Jesus is saying here. He reiterates this thought multiple times and the Bible reiterates it and says, listen, when it comes to evangelism, there's this kind of very harsh thing that Jesus said, but he says this in Matthew 7, 7 6. He says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Whoa, Jesus, are you saying the people who are not thirsty, that they're pigs and they're dogs? No, he's using an example. Jesus, are you judging people? Are you saying we should not preach? We should not give the gospel, which is valuable. It's a pearl. It is sacred to people who aren't hungry and aren't thirsty. Are you judging them, Jesus? No. In fact, the verse before this one, Jesus spends like three, four verses talking about don't judge people lest you be judged. No, Jesus is trying to make a very nuanced point here. When it comes to evangelism and when it comes to presenting the gospel, we are not to judge people, but we are to discern the moment. Discern the moment. We have to have discernment. We don't just take the gospel and throw it at anyone and everyone. Those who mock, those who have no interest in it. We are to give the gospel to those who are thirsty. That is the harvest that is ready. You see, it's a spiritual thing that is happening. And Jesus says that we are playing into this spiritual plan that God has. And there's a moment when the harvest is ready. And it is our job to discern when to present the gospel to a person. Not just throw the gospel around as if it's not sacred or valuable. But to present it in the proper time. Look at what is spiritual thirst. See, our job in personal evangelism is 
not to present the gospel just to people but to spot the people who have a spiritual thirst to discern the people around us who have a spiritual thirst what does that mean what is spiritual thirst spiritual thirst is something that's really difficult to describe because it's like an elephant in the room example there's an elephant in the room you don't talk about it you can't really say it, but there's something in the air and it's got to be addressed spiritual thirst is it works in in the same way it's a human it's a human heart a soul the spirit of a person that is unsatisfied you understand we live our life and we're fine there's some people if you come to them and you tell them tell them about a Jesus that they need or you tell them about a salvation that they need they look at you like you're crazy what salvation I don't need anything why are you trying to throw something on me I don't need your Jesus I don't need I'm not looking for salvation my friends that's how most of the world is that's how we are we're busy we're good we got things figured out there are only a few moments in life where we and our pride and our ego and our thing where we think we've got it figured out is exposed as a facade there are moments in our life where the things that we rely on let us down where the things that we never even thought about we begin to think about there are those moments when the questions of life of purpose of who we are why we're here they come up naturally nobody forces you to think about it you think about it yourself there are moments where something shifts in your life maybe it's a midlife crisis and it's the first time ever you've actually paused to think about hey what am I doing why what's what is what's the point of my life there are only few moments maybe somebody goes through a messy divorce where they go listen I thought I was perfect who am I why did this happen do you understand there are moments that happen where we and our false hopes they're exposed and we are honest with ourselves those moments are moments of spiritual thirst where we become aware that there's something that is not satisfied in us a lot of people have these moments privately where they go man why I'm at the top of my career but I'm not satisfied and those moments of spiritual thirst are when the harvest is ready let me give you a biblical example do you guys remember the story of the woman at the well it's it's written in John chapter 4 Jesus comes across this woman he's thirsty there's a well he's there to drink some physical water but the conversation with the woman that's at that well takes a really drastic turn into the personal to be honest what started out as very practical became a very personal conversation but it's once again a fascinating picture of thirst and water that's the whole topic here's the thing about people who have spiritual thirst there's a couple things that we have to understand number one most people who are spiritually thirsty misdiagnose their thirst they don't know why they feel like that they don't know why their heart is unsatisfied why they don't feel complete they misdiagnose their thirst and what ends up happening is they don't know what it is they start blaming that thirst that unsatisfaction on other things usually on physical things not realizing that it's a spiritual thirst they start trying to find practical things in their life to point at and say that's what makes me unhappy that's what makes me feel unfulfilled and they start pointing at that so they misdiagnose their thirst and instead of finding that out that it's within and it's a spiritual thirst they try to find reasons for it on the outside and so they also come up with a wrong if they have the wrong diagnosis they also have the wrong treatment plan they start trying to answer that thirst with physical things and it doesn't work and that's what happened with this woman at the well what seemed like a regular conversation became personal because Jesus wanted to highlight something for us today of how spiritual thirst looks so Jesus is talking to this woman and the conversation from somebody he never met before goes really personal and 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 what starts is just Jesus asking for water begun begins a conversation about her spiritual thirst and just like any person who's spiritually thirsty she doesn't know that she's spiritually thirsty but there's a deep unsatisfaction with something if you follow the conversation closely you'll realize really quickly that there's one sensitive subject that she keeps going back to and Jesus keeps pressing on it's a problem with her identity see she's spiritually thirsty inside 
But the way that she diagnoses it is she's like, you know what? I'm done with those Jews. I'm angry at the Jews. I'm a Samaritan woman. My identity is nothing. And the reason why I feel unhappy is because of those Jews who put down all of us Samaritans. And she brings, and you see that all throughout the conversation, she's, even the way it begins, she says, you, a Jewish man, why are you asking me, a Samaritan woman, for water? Like, it's almost like, are you like making fun of me? Why are you here? Why are you asking me? Jesus begins a conversation on her spiritual thirst that she doesn't really fully comprehend. And he says, listen, if you knew, he says this in, in 4.10, you don't know what God can give you. If you knew who I was, and asked, who asked you for a drink, if you knew, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. He starts taking the conversation into a spiritual topic that she can't fully comprehend yet. And so she misunderstands what Jesus says and she says, listen, what are you saying? Well, you have better water than the water that this well can produce? Now that, that was personal for her. It was a sensitive subject. Why? This well was not just any other well. The well that they were sitting at was Jacob's well. It was a well that was dug by one of the patriarchs, Jacob himself. He drank from it. His kids drank from it. His livestock drank from it. And this was something that the Samaritans had of worth. They had a well on this mountain that was special. It, it traces back to the forefathers of their faith. What, this water is not good for you? It's not good enough for you, Jesus? Are you greater than Jacob? She misunderstands. He's talking about spiritual water. She takes, why? Because she's responding out of something she's sensitive to. This water is not good enough for you. And then the conversation con continues and she goes, listen, our fathers, they used to worship on this mountain all the time. But the Jews came and you know what they said? That the only worship that can happen has to happen in Jerusalem. The problem here is that most Samaritans never made it to Jerusalem. They weren't welcome there. So they were effectively cut off. Their worship wasn't recognized. Once again, do you see the theme that keeps going on from her pain? She sees that she's unhappy, and what she thinks is making her unhappy is her Samaritan identity. And so she keeps alluding to it, but Jesus says, no, 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 no. He keeps going the other direction and talking about a spiritual water. You are having a spiritual thirst. If you only knew, and he says, listen, God is raising up worshipers that will worship in spirit and truth. They don't need to be in Jerusalem. They can be anywhere. Listen, I'm going to give you water that if you drink of it, you will never thirst again. It will be a spring inside of you, and it will lead you to eternal life. He goes for the very heart of the problem and she doesn't even realize it at first but here's how the story ends jesus asks another provocative question he says hey listen go tell this to your husband she goes i don't have a husband <laughs> he's like yeah you're right because you've had five that's the thing with spiritual thirst when you misdiagnose it you try to fulfill it in the wrong ways her way of trying to fulfill her identity what was her thirst? Her thirst was she wanted to matter. She blamed the Jews and her Samaritan heritage for not mattering. She wanted to be seen. She wanted to be someone. She wanted to be noticed. That was her spiritual thirst. She was looking for purpose and identity. And Jesus shows her, listen, Jesus never took away her Samaritan identity. He didn't do anything about that. But he went for something better. He went to the core and said, listen, you've tried filling this in with husbands. You've tried to find meaning and identity through marrying a bunch of different guys. It doesn't work. I'm going to give you something better. And he says, and she walks away. And this is my, 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 my favorite part. She walks away. And when Jesus gives her this living water, look at what she says. And this is her first real true statement where you see that her spiritual thirst was, not, was, was met. It was something supernatural happened. She ran away and she says, a man told me everything I have ever done. Come see him. Maybe he's the Messiah. You see, the first job in evangelism is to be sensitive to spot spiritual thirst and to connect the thirst with the source that can satisfy that thirst. You have to be sensitive. It doesn't happen just on a stage. It doesn't happen on Sunday. It happens in regular life where you are sensitive. But here's the thing. 
when you do spot spiritual thirst, there has to be boldness and urgency. In fact, look at what happens right the next verse after she runs away saying, this guy could be the Messiah. She runs away. Something was satisfied. And the very next moment, the Bible says that the disciples come to Jesus. And I love the way it says it. It says, it doesn't say that they asked this, but it mentions that they didn't ask this, which means that this is what they were thinking. They come to Jesus and they were wondering, why were you talking to that lady? Why would you want to talk to her? And look at how Jesus responds in chapter 4, verse 35 through 39, just a couple moments. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ready for harvesting now. That whole picture was for our sake to understand that that's what evangelism looks like. He says, open your eyes. We have to open our eyes to see the thirst around us. Look at the fields. We have to spend the time looking into the heart of people, spending time with people, not just throwing the gospel. They reject it, we move on. No, you have coworkers and neighbors that you live with and you pray for. And when the moment is there, gather the harvest. In fact, he goes on in verse 38. He says, I sent you to harvest the crop that you did not work for. You see, that's how spiritual thirst works. God is leading every person to himself. He's drawing them. He doesn't abuse people, doesn't manipulate people. He draws people to himself. He's always talking about their needs, trying to speak to them. And there's a work. When you step into that work, you're stepping into a work that you didn't do. He's already been doing. Maybe directly, maybe through other people that this person met before. But then there comes a moment where there is spiritual thirst. And Jesus says, open your eyes, notice it. Look what happened in verse 39. Many of the Samaritan people in that town believed in Jesus. A group of marginalized people believed in Jesus. Why? Because the harvest was ready. That's how personal evangelism begins. But our job is this. Don't be quick to throw the gospel at people. Instead, be sensitive to notice spiritual thirst. And when you see that, then be quick. Be bold. Because what you're doing is you're stepping in. You don't have to try to make that person ready. That person is ready. Connect them. Connect them to the source. What happens next is between them and God. But that's your moment. That's the first step of evangelism. Here's the second one. What happens when a former enemy meets their former enemy? There's a lot of doubt there's a lot of fear. When two people were warring with each other and they made a peace treaty and they meet physically for the first time, is it hugs? Is it, oh, I'm so happy to see you? Or is there a lot of apprehension, worry, wondering what's going to happen next? Is this going to hold? Is this person really peaceful towards me? There's a lot of questions. And this is really important. Why? Because it's the second step of evangelism. Where did God find us? Romans 8, 5, 8 says this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Two verses later, it goes even more concrete. And it says, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. See, when Jesus finds us, when repentance and evangelism happen, he finds us while we're his enemies. And when he opens up and we go, listen, my heart is thirsty. A person realizes their thirst and they see the source of satisfaction. And they believe the first thing that they have to understand is that the one that they were enemies with is a good God. A lot of people rush to try to get people to repent. I would say that that's not the proper way of doing it. Not I can't say about every situation, but a general rule is not to rush to judgment, to explaining sin. No, the first job is to introduce a good God. Do you understand that we are his enemies? That means God has been our enemy. And when we meet him, there's a lot of fear. Think about all throughout history. Every religion has been deathly afraid of their gods. Even the ones they invented themselves, they're afraid of them. Always trying to please them, somehow give them some fruit, give them a little bit of smoke, give them something so that they wouldn't hurt me. And God comes into the picture 
and look at what happens. What's the first thing God does when he finds us, his enemies? He demonstrates his love by dying for us. That's the first, that's the introduction. Think about the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a cheat. He was, everybody in town knew him because he was, he was a cheat. He robbed people. He used his position of authority to take advantage of people. He was a wicked, horrible human being. All right? Jesus meets this man. What's the first thing he does? Zacchaeus, you want to be with me? You better repent. You better go pay back all those people that you gypped. No. Jesus comes up to him and says, hey, get down from the tree. I'm going to come to your house. We're going to have dinner. That's how God introduces himself. That's where it begins. Repentance follows. Because that's the most beautiful thing. When you meet Jesus, the natural response is repentance. The moment Zacchaeus looked and in his house, despite what all the neighbors are mumbling and whispering, and despite his horrible reputation, that Jesus, God, honored him by having dinner in his house, the first thing he did was say, I repent. I'm going to pay back everybody. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do what I did before. I'm going to pay back everybody. Jesus didn't force him. Nobody tried to convince him he needed to do it. It was a reaction to the presence of God. Do you see, once again, the word natural keeps coming up. There's a natural process. That's why the second step is always not to rush to tell people to repent. It's to introduce them to a God. When I meet with somebody who's angry with God, I don't deal with their anger. I don't try to talk to them about their anger. I try to talk to them about God. I don't want to talk about your anger. I don't want to talk about all of those things. Let's start with the real thing here, the elephant in the room. Do you know that God created you? Did you know that when God made you, he didn't make you so that you'd have problems, that you would get hurt by people, that you would have a life that is, 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 is depressing? God didn't create death. He didn't create. He created you to live, to have purpose, to be known by him, to have a purpose from him, to live in joy and in an abundance of life with him. That's who my God is. Everything that's gone wrong with you and your life and the thing that led to your anger has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with sin. God never intended for sin to be on this earth. We chose it and we perpetuate it. That's why we're miserable. That's why our personal lives in this whole world is miserable. But God is so good that even in the midst of that, he came and he died for you. Even though we decided to go against him, he still loved you. Enough to come. And even though you didn't even value it or understand it at the time, he died for you. Why? To give you a chance to restore what was lost. That's the truth. I want to introduce this good God. That's what the gospel means. It's good news. To introduce a good God. That's what Jesus did with Zacchaeus. And the very next thing that followed was repentance. Friends, here's the thing with repentance. I think repentance, when it's in its right place, when it happens naturally, it needs to happen boldly. When a person meets God and they're, they're like, listen, I, 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 what, what do I got to do? What's the next step? That's when we have to be bold and straightforward. Because some Christians, when they do personal evangelism, they miss this point. They just talk about a good God, but they don't follow through with the actual full gospel message, which is repentance. But it has to be covered. What is something that you would say, listen, this is repentance. Or this person became a believer. A person has to repent. And you can talk boldly about it when a person is open for it. When they're looking for it. When they understand. And here's what we have to do in step three. We have to make sure that a person repents. That they understand what repentance really is. And the decision that they're making. Because the decision they're making has to be a conscious decision without made by any pressure or manipulation, it has to be a personal decision. It has to be a decision that the person will stick by. And so what is repentance? Repentance is talking about, listen, everything that you've done up to this point, the way you've lived your life, how you were your own boss, you were your own God, your will mattered more than anything. It's exactly that reason why the world is a mess and why our life, no matter how good it can be, and it can be really good, but it still slides down. 
it still has a lot of pain and suffering. Why? Because we're in control of our own life. What you need to do is make a decision to turn away from your own way. You have to make a conscious decision to say, I'm done with my path that I've been taking. I'm not qualified to be God of my life. My will is not perfect. A lot of times it's ruled not by my good. Sometimes it's ruled by good, but a lot of times it's ruled by my selfishness. A lot of times it's ruled by these inner passions that drive me to do things that I don't think I would do on a normal day. I'm done with that. And so repentance is showing a person that, listen, God is good. He came to die for you. But to take hold of his life, you have to first turn away from your old life. Ask God for forgiveness for all the pain, all the sin, doing all those things that play into sin. That's the first thing. And number two, you have to embrace God. Turning away from one path means that you're turning onto another one. That means if you, if before you were your own God, now he is your God. If it was your will that ruled, now he rules your will. If it was your ideas of what truth are, now he has a truth that he will reveal to you and you live by his truth. It shapes your everyday life. There has to be this moment. If this moment doesn't happen, if there's not a person who can make a conscious decision, if the person never does that, it is not repentance. It is not the harvest gathered. My friends, it's not. So we have to, and you can do this boldly when the time is right, when it's natural, when a person is seeking it. That's why God said, that's why Jesus said, don't do this. Don't bring something so sacred to, to a dog who won't value it. It's just an example saying, listen, don't do that. Don't cast your pearls before swine. No, no, no. Give it to somebody who values it. And repentance is valuable in its time when a person is there. And so that's what we have to do for step three. And then here's the last step. I have a couple minutes. Here's the last step. And this one is extremely important. The two greatest evangelists for me, this is just my personal take, <laughs> is Jesus and Paul. Great examples of evangelists, right? But look at how they did evangelism. They didn't just lead people to the truth. Jesus didn't just get people to believe in him. Paul didn't just get people to believe in Jesus. That was only one part of their evangelistic method. The second part was they stayed. Apostle Paul, busy, church planter, always on the move, traveling the whole world. Anytime he would establish a church where people would believe and repent, before moving on, he'd spend a few years there. Jesus gets people to believe, walks with them for years. Why? Discipleship. Discipleship is part of your personal evangelism task. It's not just to get people to come to church and to believe in Jesus. It's to disciple people. In fact, the Great Commission makes it very specific. That you are to make disciples. You are to disciple and teach people. That means that bringing somebody to the moment of believing is the first step. The next step, which you are responsible for just as much as the first step, is to disciple a person. That's what Jesus did. That's what Apostle Paul did. But what is discipleship? How do we do that when we're just regular people? Or maybe you haven't been a Christian for that long, or you don't know all the answers. Am I qualified to this? Yes, you are. If God used you to bring somebody to the truth, and they repented and they believed through you, or you brought them to church, but it was through you because you brought them, and they gave their life to God, it is your job to disciple that person. Sunday service won't do it. A leader somewhere out there won't do it. You are tasked to do it. And it's a lot easier than you think. A lot easier. Don't make it bigger than what it really is. What is discipleship? It's to walk with a person on their personal walk of discovery of their faith. It's when you're walking with somebody as they're trying to figure things out. Trying to figure out this new life. You're just walking with them. Think about it this way. When God finds us, he finds us where we are while we're his enemies. And there's a truth that we now accept and we believe in, but then there's our practical life of where we are. The truth never changes. It's not relative, but the way we apply the truth practically is very relative. It's based on where we are. I'll give you an example. Somebody, we, there's the truth of the fact that God wants a family to be one man, one woman, filled with love, shaped by the Holy Spirit. That's 
the model of truth, how God wants family to be. And when that truth finds somebody and somebody repents, every person's different. Somebody's already in a good, happy marriage. Awesome. Somebody's divorced when the truth finds them. Well, now it's like, okay, well, in this situation, how do I apply this truth to my life? What do I do? Because God's not interested in you just believing the truth. He's interested in you applying it practically. But how do I apply? Or what about when the truth finds somebody and they're in a gay marriage? How do you take this grand truth and apply it practically? How do you walk that out? I'll give you the most provocative one. What about when the truth finds somebody and they've already transitioned and they're transgendered? How do you apply God's truth in that situation? Do you see why it's important to walk with people? That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't think it beneath himself to walk with the disciples as they tried to find how to apply these deep truths Jesus was teaching them practically. He would repeat himself over and over through the years. He would say the same thing from different angles. He would give them nuanced explanations to their nuanced questions that were personal. He walked with them when they needed encouragement, he offered it. When they needed correction, he offered it. When they needed to just be defended from all the religious people around that were trying to destroy them, he defended them. The whole point is he was there with a journey. See, God's truth is truth. It is absolute. But the way it's applied is a personal thing, and it happens over time. And somebody has to be there the same way that somebody was there for you. Jesus spent years, Apostle Paul spent years, but there was a time when somebody was mature enough to eat solid food on their own. They didn't need somebody to help them with every little question. But imagine what would happen if Apostle Paul planted a church and left. How long would that church last? Friends, I'm wrapping up. All I'm saying is this. If Jesus did it, it's our job too. You don't have to have the answers for that transgendered person, for the gay couple. You don't have to have answers for the messy situation of somebody going, listen, I believe in that, but how do I apply it? Or explain it better to me. Because does it, it, maybe, there's, maybe there's a misunderstanding in mainstream Christianity. When a person is going through a process, you don't need to have all the answers. You just need to be there. You are not the source of answers. He is. Your job is to walk with the person as they find them. That's what discipleship is. And you cannot separate that from the mission of personal evangelism. Amen? Friends, we're going to stand up. We're going to pray. We're going to have communion today. Before we ask Pastor Vlad here, can I pray for everybody here? I want to pray for us. And I want to challenge you, friends. We've talked about the need to be sensitive to spot spiritual thirst. We've talked about the need to, con to connect those that are thirsty to the source. And to introduce them to a good God. To walk people through repentance and to walk in discipleship with people. But here's the thing. If you don't take the first step, you won't take the next three. So I want to challenge us to pray today that God would inspire us to do what? To be sensitive to see the people in our life. Your neighbors, co-workers, your family members who are thirsty. Don't feel weird about coming up to them. When you see that thirst, bring living water because you're the source of living water. Remember what Jesus said? I'm going to give you water. I'm going to put a source in you. It is going to overflow. God gave you the Holy Spirit. Father, we come to you and we just ask today, so simply, God, help us to take these grand things, these grand missions, these lofty ideas father and to apply them on a practical way in our life god teach us to be sensitive to you to be sensitive so that your spirit can point to us those who are thirsty those who you've prepared father for them to hear because they're, they're ready god help us to see those people and give us boldness in the name of jesus to take that moment to gather the harvest, not to be ashamed, not to be those who walk by because we're too busy or we don't care. I thank you, Jesus, for inviting us to such a responsible mission in your kingdom. We honor you. We glorify you, God. And we pray, Jesus, that something would be changing in our practical life, that we would be growing your kingdom in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God. I honor you. We're going to have communion, friends. Can you help me welcome Pastor Vlad Kalinyuk, who's going to lead us through communion.
If you don't have a cup, go to the back right now. We have brothers there that can give you that um, a, a cup for communion, okay? We're going to shift a little bit as we end service. What's, ha- what's here on this table? It says that someone died. There was a time when someone died. But there's so much more behind this death. Uh, There's a scripture in the Bible that says that there's no greater love than when someone lays down their life for who? For a friend, right? Can you imagine a human laying down life for another human? Just stop and think. You have one life. They have one life. Only one. You can't bring it back. They lay down a life for another life. Do you know what that, that means? They had one life. You had one life. They laid down life for you. A human. For a human. That's deep. That's profound. That's very humbling. I wondered to myself, if someone did that for me, what would be my connection to their family? To the wife of that husband. To the husband of that wife. To their parents of that individual that laid down life for me they were not forced to they 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 stepped out and they laid down their life for me what would i how would i relate what would the rest of my life be like years to come every time i see them face to face the mom and dad of that son what would i say would i get get would i ever get used to it or would it always be this humbling deep profound something that's just deeply imprinted forever until I die you can think about it for yourself even when you go home what that means to lay down somebody to lay down the life for somebody else on a human level scripture says first John chapter 3 this is how we know what love is Jesus Christ laid down his life for us mm. This is how we know what life is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. To a person on the side observing the last few days of Jesus on earth, they will probably come to a conclusion that something's wrong here. Something's not right. He, he does, he's not guilty. There's no meetings of rebellion, planning. There's no scheme. Something is fishy. Somebody must have wanted him gone. And they wanted him gone bad. And then they hear, crucify him. Oh, that, those voices. Somebody wanted him gone for sure. As they scream, crucify him, that, probably, that just meant you don't belong. Your life was worth nothing. In God's eyes, what Jesus was saying is, I am laying down my life. You are not taking it away from me. You think you're crucifying me. You think my life is worth nothing. Let me tell you, they had no idea what this was happening. I am laying down my life. Nobody is forcing me. Nobody is making me do anything. This is my will. This is my decision. I am laying down my life. So when it seems like the plan of God is just falling in shambles, this is not working. This is not the way it's supposed to be. In God's eyes, it's just coming together. Everything is just coming together piece by piece. Let me tell you something else. When you see people dying maybe in Afghanistan and you hear stories, somebody laying down their life and you think, well, this is not how it's supposed to be. No, my friend. The war is spiritual. For every death that when a person says, I believe in Jesus, he is my savior, and they lay down their life, Christianity just won a big battle. We just won. See, winning and losing is very, the definition of winning and losing in God's eyes, in the scripture's eyes, very different. What seems to the, to the side person observing says, this this is not, no, this is, this is just the end. In God's eyes, in the spiritual realm, there's a big victory that's happening. This is how we know love is Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. The question, what is love? 
and then you think, man, where do I end? How do I stop? There's so much to say. What is love? The waiting question. What is love? What can you say? After all the answers that come in, after everything has been said, after everything has been read, to answer the question of what is love, I actually came to a conclusion today that there is one final answer. What is love? That question, that answer is Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That, my friend, is love. That's, that's final. I can't understand the better answer. Love is Jesus laid down his life for you and for me. That's it. So for those of you who are new to the Christian faith, you were water baptized. You know, in, in life, you're going to get a lot of, you're going to feel tug of war. The world, the system of the world, the tendencies of the world, it's going to pull you. It's going to ask for your devotion. It's going to ask for your love, for your commitment, for your passion, for you to fall in love with things, with stuff, with idols. Remember, how we know love, how you came to know love is that Jesus Christ died for you. So if a human dies for a human and it arouses such honor and such, such love and loyalty, how much more when Jesus Christ laid down His life for us? What is my response, friend? If the human death lasts only temporary, everyone eventually dies, Jesus' death has impact after death. It's eternal repercussions the impact is eternal life of a human for a human is temporary it's an amazing thing but it's temporary it doesn't fix the problem after I die what's next Jesus gave his life eternal impact eternal ramifications eternal salvation and so what's my response I live for him now I live for him I cannot live for myself how can I live for myself? He did so much for me. Let's close our eyes. I thank you so much, Jesus Christ, for laying your life down for me. I know it's a simple Sunday school phrase that love is that Jesus died for me, that for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, and we know this and we quote this. But that's why the sign on this table says, do this in remembrance of me. You remember remember and don't forget that I died for you remember and don't forget that there is more to life than your dreams your career your everything that you have remember that my life and my death impacts your future impacts your eternity impacts what happens to you when you die and that's why you are not afraid when you face diseases when you even face death you don't have to be afraid because I, I solved that dilemma. I solved that problem. I died for you. Jesus, thank you for laying your life down for me. The only thing I can do in response is give you back my life in my daily living. Say no to myself. Say no to passions of the world. Say no to the tug of war in my soul and my heart. And saying yes to you. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I will follow you all the days of my life. Because you died for me. And there is no greater love or definition of love than the fact that Jesus Christ laid down his life for me and for you. And that's why we take communion. I ask you now, we won't have a song. Just have music in your heart of prayer before the Lord. You can just open the first portion and gain access to a small loaf of bread we can just do this together as we remain in a state of prayer God but let's never forget the price let's never forget what you've done for me 
if we feel such deep things on a human level God when a human dies for a human we read articles of what happened in Afghanistan the man and the woman the last days there they were young 20 21 23 19 life was just before them and this is what happened and then we go into the scripture and then we read that there is this is what love is that you died for me God I can I can meditate on this just endlessly and be amazed and be in awe never really come to full understanding of what really happened it's a no open-ended book that is to be it's a depth that we can never God fathom and understand and process it always just creates amazement within us it humbles us it brings us together God that's why it's so it's a beautiful thing that we are here a family God you didn't die for the crowd for the bunch you died for me you died for her you died for every single person here it was personal you made it personal you came for me you came for me you came for all who will believe in you God and we just bless your name we pray for those who made a commitment to follow you today let them go through life let their life be a living sacrifice let nothing in this life separate them from your love and let them always be reminded that, that real love is you dying for them and this always pushes us to go to not give up to not doubt to run to you and we are afraid when we don't know the way you will show us the way I thank you for the ultimate sacrifice we pray in Jesus name and everybody said amen God is good praise the Lord God spoke to us today through the message God bless you have a great day enjoy your weekend